Welcome back to the Dirt Show. Always miss you for the several days that we're not doing the Dirt Show. You can always see me on Locals, which I do every single day. Uh, a few years ago, I was um, in Rockefeller Center uh, about to go up to uh, the NBC studios to do a television interview. And a guy comes over to me and puts his arm around me and says, Hey, I'm a big fan. Um, here's the guy. I didn't know who he was at the time. Uh, now I know who he is. His, his name is uh, something like um, Rock something, um, you know. Um, uh, he's become very famous for being slapped in the face um, by Will Smith. And so <laughs> I've been getting emails and calls from people all over with one simple question. Um, did Will Smith commit? A crime. Um, could he be prosecuted under California law? I am, after all, the expert in that uh, issue. And, and the answer is, is fairly clear. Uh, California law defines battery very, very broadly. Any willful and unlawful use of force upon the person of another. And um, a number of the cases give as examples a slap on the face, a slap on the face, spitting at somebody. You don't have to cause harm. It doesn't have to be violent. It's just an unlawful uh, touching. And uh, obviously what happened at the Oscars uh, last night was an unlawful and unwelcome uh, touching. Um, and in fact, uh, the standard instruction uh, in California says, quote, words, no matter how opprobrious, do not give you justification to hit another person. So no matter what you might think of Chris Rock's stupid joke, and it was a stupid joke, um, I don't know whether he knew about the illness that afflicted Will Smith's wife that caused her to lose her hair. By the way, she looks absolutely gorgeous. Am I allowed to say that? Yeah. Um, she looks absolutely gorgeous uh, with her short cropped hair, but it's not not the appropriate subject for a joke. Look, I think many of the things that were said at the Oscars last night were not appropriate subjects for jokes. Uh, uh, Jennifer Lawrence, oh, you put on a little weight. Um, no, you know, you don't talk about things like that. And I think the Oscars have had bad humor for a, a long, long time. And there's a lot of inside humor, you know, people making fun of each other and including making fun of each other's uh, wives. And uh, um, Will Smith has particularly been the butt of some jokes about his open infidelity. Uh, he doesn't call it an infidelity. He just says it's an open marriage. But there have been jokes told uh, referencing both his wife and him uh, along those lines. But this was not an appropriate joke to tell, particularly by someone who, if he knew about the illness, should have instead uh, just left it alone. But, you know, when you, when you watch it on television, immediately um, Will Smith laughs. Then he turns to his wife and sees she isn't laughing. So he then takes on the role of defender of black women. Uh, he gave an interview in which he said he's devoted his life to defending black women, and, and, and he should defend black women against violence, but not against bad jokes. Uh, there's a big difference between defending somebody against violence and defending somebody against uh, bad humor. Um, look, under the law, there's absolutely no justification for what Will Smith did to Chris Rock. He smacked him in the face. Um, Chris Rock has said he's not going to file a complaint under California law. That's not necessary. Uh, for a civil suit, you have to file a complaint. There has to be a complainant. If he wanted to sue him for tort, he would have to be the complainant. But uh, in California, as in most other states, um, the state can bring charges. Uh, usually you don't because there are no witnesses. Here there were, what, 100 million witnesses? Um, videotapes? Uh, you don't need um, you don't need Chris Rock's testimony to prosecute uh, Will Smith. I don't I don't think Will Smith will be uh, prosecuted, um, but um, he could be. He could be. He he has technically at least uh, 
committed the crime of battery, not the crime of assault, interestingly enough, because under California law, assault requires what the law defines as violence. And, you know, you can make an argument that it was violent, but a slap on the face like that does not constitute the kind of violence that I think was contemplated by the assault statute. Um, you know, often people put together assault and battery, but they're actually separate crimes. An assault is generally an attempted battery, threatening somebody. Uh, it, assault doesn't require a physical touching. Battery requires a physical touching here. There was a physical touching. When I first saw it, like so many people, I thought it was scripted. I thought it was part of the show. And then when, of course, the um, sound went off, <laughs> I realized somebody was saying something that somebody didn't want us to hear, and that suggested the possibility maybe this was unscripted. Well, it, it was unscripted, and it was uncalled for, and it shouldn't have happened. And the Academy has now condemned it and said it will look into what further action may be required. I don't think there'll be any further action required. Um, you know, lots of people have won lots of Oscars, uh, and um, they've acted in ways that might incline somebody to take their Oscars away, but that hasn't been the, the methodology of the Academy of Motion Pictures. So uh, I suspect that the Oscar will stand. Um, whether Will Smith will be invited to next year's uh, Oscars, uh, as usually the former winner of Best Actor is invited, um, remains to be seen. I, I don't know the answer to that. What I do know is this, and this is serious. Will Smith is a role model. Now look, I remember Mike Tyson, my former client, saying, I'm not a role model. I don't want young kids to be like me. But uh, Will Smith is a role model. He holds himself out as a role model, a protector of black women. That's not the kind of message I think a winner of the Academy Award should be sending to young kids that if you don't like what somebody says, slap them. Um, you know, it was Sigmund Freud many years ago who said, civilization began on the day the first man hurled an insult instead of a sword or, or a spear. And um, civilized responses to bad jokes or to call them out. Imagine how much better it would have been if Will Smith had gotten up and said, Chris, do you know what you're doing here? You're making a joke of somebody who suffers from an illness that uh, many people suffer from, and that's not uh, an appropriate basis for, for Yuma. So I would politely ask you to apologize to my wife. I'm sure Rock would have apologized, and the, the matter would have been over, and a very good, very good message would have been sent from a, a, a role model to um, young kids out there, or even not so young kids. You know, the tragedy is that we live in an age today when speech, which is not liked by some people, is responded to by violence, whether it be uh, violent organizations uh, like Antifa, which threaten violence when right-wing speakers uh, take the platform. They threaten violence against me. Um, I'm not a right-winger, but I'm pro-Israel, and when I made a speech uh, on a university campus, they had to call guards because Antifa threatened uh, violence. I've been threatened many times with violence. In Toronto, uh, the police got a message that violence, serious violence, lethal violence, was to be directed at me. And they stood on the stage with uh, uh, bulletproof glass shields to protect me as I, as I spoke. Um, you know, uh, there's, there's, there's rumors today that some of um, people that Putin doesn't like uh, may have recently been poisoned in Kiev. I don't know whether that's true. I do know that Putin almost certainly has poisoned uh, people, including a friend of mine, uh, Erwin Cutler, the former Minister of Justice of Canada, who went to try to defend one of Putin's enemies and ended up getting very sick with what he believes was radiation poisoning. He doesn't think anybody tried to kill him. He thinks that that they were sending him a message that next time it could be worse um, because they know how to kill. Look, I think I've told you before, 
I was representing the president of Ukraine. This is probably 15 years ago. His name was Kuchma. And um, I was about to help present the argument in court on a Monday. On Sunday, the lawyers were all meeting in, in a hotel and one of the lawyers didn't show up. And when they checked his room, he was dead of a heart attack. And we know that the KGB knows how to administer heart attacks that are non-traceable. And so uh, they got me out of the country as soon as possible to avoid the same thing happening to me. And I did the rest of my legal consultation uh, in Ukraine by Zoom. Um, I don't think I'm going back there anytime soon or to the to Russia. Uh, but that's not the way we do things in the United States. In the United States, we're supposed to respond to bad speech by good speech, by better speech. If a comedian tells a bad joke, call him out on it. Boo him. It's okay to boo. Uh, I would have been very happy if, if um, Will Smith had gotten a boo, 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 sit down, no, no. That would be fine. That's, that's free speech as long as you don't shout him down, as long as you allow him to respond. And, of course, Chris Rock did respond. He just said, it was a joke. It was just about uh, G.I. Jane. Yeah, it was a joke. It was a bad joke and uh, a tasteless joke. But again, you don't respond to tasteless jokes with uh, slaps in the face. And if a slap in the face is tolerated, uh, next time it will be a punch in the face, giving new meaning to the concept of punchline. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, that was, I couldn't avoid that. But uh, there was no punchline. It was only a slap line. But he wasn't hurt. Uh, it was more like being spit on, which is an assault, or being slapped. Look, in the old days, Alexander Hamilton's time, slap meant a duel to the death. That wasn't what was done there, although it was very much a verbal duel. But verbal duels are to be preferred over physical duels. And even though this only involved a slap in the face, that's permission. To, to do more. And I think the Academy was right in, in responding. Um, and uh, we'll see what else happens. There will not, the, the DA's office hasn't responded to comments, but uh, I don't believe that there'll be um, a criminal prosecution, um, largely for priorities. I mean, if nobody is filing a complaint, then generally the prosecution will not move forward. Um, by the way, if this were a man who slapped a woman in the context of a domestic dispute under the law of California and some other states, there wouldn't even be much discretion. They would have to prosecute. And I've seen cases where uh, a mere slap in a domestic context um, can result in a prosecution, usually for a misdemeanor. But, uh, you know, being prosecuted for a misdemeanor can be pretty serious. It can entail prison time, short amount of either jail or prison time. Um, it only results in a felony if it causes serious harm or other considerations. For example, a touching, but a sexual touching, um, say somebody on a, uh, in a subway who touches somebody inappropriately sexually, that could be a felony and uh, uh, could carry with it uh, more time in prison. This was certainly not that. This was a a symbolic, a symbolic slap. Um, you know, one can argue that a symbolic slap should be considered like speech because after all, it didn't hurt anybody. It just was, I'm so angry. Um, I, I, I guess I don't want to make a comparison, but you can make a comparison to President Biden's symbolic slap at, um, um, at Putin. Um, Joe Biden didn't have in his speech the statement that uh, Putin shouldn't be allowed to lead his country, but he was so angry. He was so outraged by what he had seen in Ukraine and Poland. He wasn't in Ukraine, but what he had seen of Ukraine in Poland that he went outside the script and he slapped, not physically, but verbally, slapped Putin. And that required uh, the White House to state unequivocally and the State Department to state unequivocally, no, it is not the policy of the United States to be seeking uh, regime change. And today, um, President Biden clarified that even more in what I thought was quite a good uh, television interview with a lot of answers to hard questions, which he said, look, I was just outraged. I'm not backing away from 
what I said, but it's not a change of policy. It's just an expression of outrage by the leader of the free world, the man who has access to the nuclear button, the man who could start World War III if he chose to, but he's not going to. And uh, I think he's uh, right. I think uh, President Biden is right when he said, oh, Putin doesn't need an excuse for doing, for escalating. If he wants to escalate, he'll escalate. He's not going to use this as an excuse to uh, escalate. Because remember, the difference between Putin and, and Biden is Biden has polls and he has to appeal to his base and he has to maintain a majority, uh, both for the midterm elections and for the presidential elections. Putin doesn't have to do that at all. He He's going to win every election if there is uh, an election. But uh, he could still be overthrown. Uh, we know that Gorbachev essentially was overthrown, not by the people, but by the Kremlin elites when he, quote, lost the Cuban Missile Crisis. I never thought he lost the Cuban Missile Crisis. I thought he acted sensibly to defuse a terrible situation. I think it was a win-win, not a win-loss. Um, but that's not the way it was seen in the Kremlin, and we don't know how a non-win or a loss or a tie in Ukraine will be seen by people in power in the Kremlin. We have no idea. I don't think American intelligence has very much of an idea as who pulls the strings in the Kremlin other than uh, Putin. Who are the people who could overrule Putin? It's not like a parliamentary system where you bring a couple of hundred people together in a room and you raise your hand and if there's not a majority, you're out. It's not like a corporate board where you have 15 or 20 people and they can vote the CEO out. Uh, we don't know the dynamics of how uh, Putin could be, I won't say voted out, but, but, but forced out. We don't know. And we don't know whether if he were to be forced out, it would be by nonviolent means or by violent means. Of course, Russia has a long history. When the Tsar was deposed, uh, he wasn't just told, you're going to have to leave now. He was lined up with his entire family and shot with everybody in the family, maybe not Anastasia, we still don't know about her, but everybody else in the family was murdered in cold blood in order to avoid uh, a secession. A succession. Um, and so, um, you know, Russia has this, this tradition of violent transitions, unlike the American transition, which until 2020, 2021 was uh, always peaceful and almost always without dispute. Now we see there is dispute. A judge today in California, a federal judge, said, it wasn't an opinion, it wasn't, it was dictum, but he said, that he thought there was evidence to suggest that President Trump and his lawyer, I don't think he named the lawyer, um, may have committed uh, felonies in obstructing Congress and um, engaging in some kind of vague conspiracy. That doesn't seem right to me. Uh, I'd like to know what the evidence is and what the law is before I jump to any conclusion about that. But. Um, Generally, we've had, we've had transitions in government. This all comes back, of course, to, uh, at a macro level, this all comes back to the micro, 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 micro level of the Academy Awards. Um, you know, you might say big deal, it's the Academy Awards, not the government. It's, uh, but uh, the most important product that America exports to the world today is motion pictures. Um, motion pictures, give us uh, the influence that we have around the world. And so the Academy Awards is, is watched all over the world, not in Russia anymore. I'm wondering if they were able to watch it before Ukraine. They certainly were not able to watch it last night because of fear that things could be said about Ukraine. And a couple of things were said about Ukraine. Last night was actually a little less political than some of the other nights in, in the past. Some of the other nights were dominated by politics. I thought it was quite cute when the three um, female comedians um, said, and to the people of Florida, we're going to have a gay, 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 gay night. That was obviously a takeoff on what people have called the don't say gay bill in Florida. Of course, if you read the so-called don't say gay bill, it has nothing to do with saying gay. You can say it all you want. It has to do with whether children of a certain very young age 
uh, should be taught about gay, transgender, and other kinds of sexual activities or sexualities, which are appropriate for slightly older children, but you know may not be appropriate for younger children. So um, free speech, that's the key to America, nonviolence, that's the key to America. And so last night was a good night in many respects. I think that the film that won so many awards um, about uh, people who were uh, who were part of the deaf community was a wonderful, wonderful uh, statement. And uh, um, the people accepting the award, speaking in, in, and signing, just, just made me feel wonderful about America. Uh, I thought it was just terrific. Thought some of the other um, uh, winning uh, Oscars were were terrific, but then it was all marred by this physical altercation, and uh, it was not a good night for the First Amendment, for freedom of speech, for civility, for teaching young people how to respond to insults, uh, how to respond to attacks on their dignity. Um, you know, so many fights are caused by that. I mean, one of the one of the films that was up for an Academy Award and it didn't win any was um, uh, Leonard Bernstein's masterpiece, West Side Story, um, directed by, by Spielberg. But remember what happened there. I don't want to give you the ending. Spoiler alert. But uh, insults and lack of respect and racism uh, and all of that. You know, result in the tragic death of, uh, of a decent and innocent person who was trying to make his way in the world. Um, obviously, the West Side Story is based on Romeo and Juliet. For those of you who don't know, you know, the original uh, musical by Leonard Bernstein when he was very young and right out of Harvard College, um, the original musical was called East Side Story. And it was based on a conflict between uh, Jewish people on the east side of New York and Irish people on the east side of um, New York, but um, he put it in his draw and by the time he took it out again, those conflicts were no longer in the news and the conflicts um, between um, uh, people of, of, of Puerto Rican background and, and people of uh, Anglo background were, the, were a prominent source of conflict. And so he changed the, the context to uh, the West Side instead of the East Side and Puerto Rican versus undisclosed ethnic groups. Um, um, and, and I think they went out of their way to make sure they were undisclosed. The guy's name is Tony, but it's Anton. Um, and um, there was some kind of Eastern European ethnicity uh, hinted at, but not, but not clear. So... Um, Bad night for freedom of speech, bad night for lessons to young people, and um, stay tuned to see what the Academy does, um, they'll do something, and what the Los Angeles District Attorney does, they'll do nothing, and that may be the appropriate response. So, uh, have we gotten any calls? I'm here with my son who yeah. produces oh, the show. First a correction. Yep, uh, a correction. Yeah, this, uh, the... Uh... Your, your your comment that the entertainment industry is the number one export, yeah. it's number two, weapons is one. Ah, weapons is one. Okay, so I correct myself. I think, however, I'm sticking with it. I'm not backing down. Me and <laughs> Joe Biden, I'm not backing down. I think that uh, the entertainment industry uh, is the most influential export the United States makes around the world that uh, enhances our image and that makes people want to be like Americans and come to America. Let's remember with all the criticism that's made of America, people go with their feet and there's one country in the world more than any other that people want to come to and they want to wear jeans, they want to wear American t-shirts, they want to watch American movies, they want to sing American songs. So uh, I think that combination of factors is what um, makes America the most popular country in the world, even at the same time when it's one of the most criticized. And the, uh, the viewers were sort of arguing back and forth in different states. It was, uh, this would be assault. In other states, it would be battery. So they wanted to have clarity on that. 
Okay, look, um, under our constitutional system, every state has the right to define its own crimes. Traditionally, under common law, English law, which we adapted, um, assault is doing this to somebody and threatening to hurt them. The assault is up to the point where the fist hits the body. Then the assault turns into a battery. In many jurisdictions, the two are combined. In California, there are two sections of the code, uh, 240 and 242. 240 is assault, 242 is battery. Uh, section 240 requires some degree of violence. That's why assault is probably off the table. 242 does not require violence. It just requires willful and unlawful use of force. Now, just because the guy's name is Will doesn't make it willful. It has to be intentional. He has to know what he's doing, and of course the evidence is clear. He knew what he was doing. He got up. He was not in a frenzy. He walked 10 steps, and he went boom, and then they start cursing each other, and the, and, and the sound went off. So look at your own statutes. It's easy. You just Google Wisconsin law of assault, Wisconsin law of battery, and you'll see uh, whether or not uh, the criteria were met in, in any of those, in many of those states. Uh, you know, it's interesting today with Google, you really can be a lawyer. You can look it up. Now, obviously, there's case law, there's decisions, there's instructions to the jury that refine and define, but it's the statute that counts. And the statutory law does vary state to state. And probably there's no federal law, because there's no federal crime of assault. There may be assault crimes in the District of Columbia, but uh, federal crimes of assault uh, wouldn't be really part of the federal code of criminal uh, law. Any more questions from the audience? Um, or if not, I'll go to some of the old questions. Uh, you're saying criminal versus civil? Well, criminal versus civil, of course, civil, you have to have a plaintiff. And um, Will Smith is not going to Chris, sue. Chris Rock. And Chris Rock is not going to sue. Uh, and uh, there's not going to be a plaintiff or a defendant. Now, um, criminal law doesn't need uh, a complaining witness. That's a myth. Uh, there are some states and in some jurisdictions for some crimes, by law, you can't prosecute unless there's a complaining witness. That's not true in California. That's not true in most states. If it's on television. If there's a video of the crime, uh, you can you can prosecute the crime. Obviously, the most obvious crime of murder that doesn't require the most obvious crime that doesn't require a complaining witness is murder, because the complaining witness is dead. So uh, you, you, that's the difference between civil and criminal. Civil is, is is personal between two people or or groups of people, and criminal is between the state, the government, and the individual. Any more? Oh, well, this one guy just says Rumble is awesome, and I think we would agree. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, you know, it's interesting. I got a few letters like that. Mr. Dershowitz, when I first saw your podcast on Rumble, I thought it was just going, I thought I was going to hear nothing but leftist views. I'm pleased to say that isn't the case. Uh, I am more conservative than you and a Republican, but I admire the way the law takes precedence over your own personal opinion. Too bad more, more lawmakers don't act like that instead of following party lines all the time. Yeah, no, I think, I think there's, some, there's some truth to that. Um, Professor Dershowitz, on the topic of the Supreme Court, I'd like to ask whether you have a judicial philosophy of your own. Though not having served as a judge, you clerked for the late Justice Goldberg, and therefore there were cases that covered the legitimacy of the death penalty pursuant to the famous Eighth Amendment text, Cruel and Unusual Punishment. Well, I have a judicial philosophy. I'm not a judge, but uh, I argue in front of judges all the time. That's not where my judicial philosophy comes into play. Um, when I argue on behalf of a client, I'll use anybody's judicial philosophy. Um, I'll even quote Lawrence Tribe if it'll help me win the case. Certainly, I'll quote Antonin Scalia if it helps me win the case. As a criminal defense lawyer, I'm eclectic. I pick and choose uh, what my best argument is. But as an academic and as a scholar, I have a judicial philosophy um, about the Constitution. I think the Constitution is both a dead document and a living document. It's a dead document when it comes to things like, um, you have to be 35 years old to be president. 
I argued in front of the Senate that it was a dead document when it comes to the impeachment provisions of the Constitution. It says treason, bribery, or other, other high crimes and misdemeanors. And I went back to the original intent. I read all the debates in the Constitutional Convention, in the state conventions, and came to the conclusion that other high crimes and misdemeanors refer to criminal conduct akin to treason and bribery, of that degree of seriousness, of that degree of involvement in the government. And that's what I argue. The Constitution doesn't permit you to expand the concept, the criteria for impeachment to include obstruction of Congress or abuse of power. That would be a living Constitution, and I reject that. On the other hand, when you have something like the Cruel and Unusual Punishment Clause or Equal Protection, you need to interpret that clause. I, I always love to give this example. If the framers of the 14th Amendment, in which the words equal protection of the law appear, if the framers of the 14th Amendment, somebody were to get up during the debate and say, oh, by the way, does the 14th Amendment equal protection require a state to allow a black man to marry a white woman or a black kid to go to school? with a white kid, every single person in that debate would have said, are you nuts? Of course not. It doesn't apply to that. It applies, you know, to traveling on trains together, even though that was held uh, constitutionally permissible in Plessy versus uh, Ferguson. But it, nobody would have suggested that interracial marriage was part of the Equal Protection Clause. Today, nobody would suggest that it's not. Obviously, something happened. Attitudes in the country changed. It is unthinkable for a state today to tell a black person that he can't marry a white person. Unthinkable. Are there any conservatives out there, any of you, who believe in a dead constitution, who believe the constitution means what it says when it was written? Is, it, is there any one of you who would say that it would be constitutional for a state to say, no, 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 you just, you just can't get, get married. I put that issue to Justice Scalia when he came to my class as a very young justice and debated me for two hours. And he said, you got me on that one. Um, my view of textualism and originalism doesn't answer all the questions. It answers more than the other approaches do, but it doesn't answer that question. So look, there's no perfect judicial philosophy. Judicial philosophies give you an approach to how you look at a problem, but every problem requires different kinds of solutions. So I love these questions, particularly ones that give me an opportunity to be a teacher again and to express my academic views and to have you express different academic views. So I've thrown a challenge out to you now. I want you all to go to comments and answer the question. Do you think that the Equal Protection Clause today as interpreted means that a black person can't marry a white person or a black person can't go to school with a white person. Give me your answer and we'll continue to debate it on future dirt shows. Thank you, see you tomorrow.